becoming increasingly hard to make them work financially. So the number of small farms offering a full-time living from the land is shrinking. And as some of those smaller farms sell up, many medium-sized farms are left weighing up their options to diversify and find new sources of income or invest and scale up. Since 2005, the average size of a UK farm has increased by almost 19%. Fraser Jones is a third-generation dairy farmer with 5,000 beef and dairy cattle in Welshpool in Powys. We've got, um, in these sheds around us here, we've got 1,000 dairy cows um, being milked twice a day. Fraser runs an intensive indoor dairy system with his father and sister and more than 40 staff. Over time, they've grown by buying up other local farms and now he has a total of nine sites. You haven't always been this big. Tell me about the process of getting here. Previously, this farm was milking 200 dairy cows and then when I bought it, uh, I realised I had to do something, you know, if I wanted to keep being in this industry for the long term. So put in a planning application for 1,000 cows, which resulted in a planning battle and a full public inquiry to finally get the planning permission. And what was the local opposition like when you decided to expand? Um, there was huge opposition, you know, with the local village. The school is, what, 50 metres or something from my final shed. What were they worried about? Um, visual impact, noise, smell um, and the scale of things. Large-scale farms are much more common in other parts of the world. Mega farm is the term sometimes used in America, where they are defined as having more than 125,000 chickens reared for meat, or 2,500 pigs, 700 dairy cattle, or 1,000 beef cattle. Fraser's farm easily meets that qualification with its 5,000 cattle. Do you consider yourself a mega farm? No, I think mega farm is a bit of a myth. I think that's come from the States. Um, in the UK, you know, yes, there's a lot of 1,000, 2,000 cow units. Um, and to me, that's just a large family business. I see myself as a large family um, fa farming business. If you want to stay in this industry for the long term, you need to upscale your numbers because the margins are so tight. We have to have more cows so that those small, small margins add up to something that we can live on, basically. Do you think our attitude to the cost of food does play into this debate about large farms? You know, people are wanting cheap food, and for cheap food, it does mean you have to scale things up. Tell me, the cows that are here, do they ever see grass, put the foot in the field? No, so these cows are in uh, all, all year round. Are you happy with that? I'm very happy with that. It gives us better control. Cows like consistency, so they have a specific diet to meet all their nutritional requirements. They're eating the same every day, which then results in less health issues. Um, so basically, to me, the welfare here is good. Can you really keep on top of the welfare? Can you make sure that that one over there is still healthy and well? So we've got about 43 cameras all around the farm, in all the sheds. With the technology we've got available these days, each cow is being monitored 24-7 by uh, the collars that you can see on the cows. And that's telling me when she needs breeding. It's telling me if she's not eating enough, not drinking enough. Um, it tells me everything. And also, a lot of it comes down to our staff. You know, when you've got a thousand cows, you have dedicated people to a dedicated role. So they become specialists in those areas. So you talk about having specialist staff. Do you have a specialist staff to, to manage slurry, to manage the muck? Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, specialist tractor drivers and we, uh, we analyse all our slurry. All of our manures and fertilisers are done through a GPS system. So it's all very scientific. So a big farm is no worse for the environment? Absolutely not. There are environmental rules for large-scale farms. Across the UK, any farm with capacity for more than 40,000 poultry, 2,000 pigs or 750 sows needs an environmental permit, covering areas like waste management. Large beef and dairy farms aren't covered by permits. Critics say large-scale farms can be detrimental for both the environment and animal welfare. Anthony Field is the UK head of campaign group Compassion in World Farming. We're seeing an intensification of farms themselves and the units that, that the animals are being kept within. The group says its research shows there are now nearly 1,200 mega pig and poultry units in the UK. The largest factory farms have grown 12% uh, in the last seven years, so the industrial farming system is growing when actually we feel it shouldn't be. 
large farms can afford to employ people specifically to maintain welfare. We've been to one farm like that where they've got a lot of staff, they've got money to get expertise on welfare. Surely that could heighten welfare. We're looking in the UK at a billion animals being kept in these intensive systems every single year. You know, if you look at the meat chickens, if you like, mm -hmm. they are overcrowded. They don't have access to fresh air. They don't have the, the soil under their feet. Those are not good conditions. If we produce less of this cheaper meat here, aren't people just going to import it from overseas, thereby exporting the problem overseas? If we set high animal welfare standards, if the government does that, they also need to make sure that the trade agreements that we have with other countries doesn't allow cheaper imports with lower welfare to come in. And what we hear from consumers is they want higher welfare products and therefore our animals will be seen the world over as having high welfare and will be in demand around the world. So it's a win-win for us. Isn't the fact that we've got these large farms because by and large they produce cheaper food and that's what the customer's demanding? You say they, they, they provide cheap food. You actually pay for the food three times. One in the subsidies to run the farms, two to pay for the food at the till, and three to mop up the pollution. If you look at the River Wye, that's been downgraded because of the number of chicken farms and tensory poultry units along its way and the pollution from them. A significant proportion of the food we eat now comes from a smaller number of bigger scale producers. An estimated 80% of the UK's pig herd is now owned by around 30 businesses and around 75% of chicken meat is supplied by just three companies. Professor Janet Dwyer is an agricultural economist from the University of Gloucestershire. She says uncertainty over official schemes that offer farms financial support could mean that some small farms decide to sell up. The prediction is that there'll be fewer farms in future because the withdrawal of the basic payment is basically going to make a lot of farmers, particularly smaller farmers, particularly farmers who are older, maybe don't have successors, to think, actually, I'm out of here. I'm better off leaving it and letting somebody else take on the land. And if land comes onto the market, the most likely buyer will be the neighbouring farms. And certain types of farming are doing better than others, meaning it can be easier for them to scale up. Dairying is doing quite well. That's been partly because of a big increase in consumer demand over the last few years as, you know, the coffee shop phenomenon <laughs> has taken off. Otherwise, obviously, poultry is doing very well and poultry is a, an enterprise that scales very well. And that's partly a response to the fast food chains wanting increasingly to source their product from the UK rather than relying on imports. Is size always going to be the key to survival in farming? No, not necessarily. There are different strategies. You know, there will be some farms that will go for the keeping getting bigger because you try to spread your fixed costs over a larger area of land and a larger volume of output. But for other people, the future might well be in, in staying smaller but looking to increase the return that you get from the produce that you generate on your farm. And that might be something like direct selling. It could be a farm shop and actually there are some brilliant businesses that have built up on the basis of selling direct through a farm shop. Abby Allen is part of a family farming business that's staying small and trying something different. As well as rearing their own beef near Exeter in Devon, they're also helping other small-scale farmers link up directly to customers which Abby says means more money reaches farmers' pockets. Last year, they sold 80,000 food boxes online. We have a community of about 50 small-scale farms that all produce for us. We agree a price and then we stick to that commitment all the way through the process. It's not appropriate in every landscape for a farmer to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They just simply don't have the space. And what does being part of a group deliver for the farmers? How does it help them? There are so many steps in the chain from small scale abattoirs, from the processing element with the butchers. So what we provide is that really great network that makes that process so much easier, shortens that supply chain down and delivers direct to the customer. Mark Chappell is one of the farmers in Abbey's network, supplying free range chickens from his farm in Devon. Well, what's the advantage of being in a group? It's the, the opportunity for us to scale up a bit because it's quite a, a, a labour-intensive way of doing the chicken. The whole marketing thing is, is quite hard work, so being able to tap into 
their marketing strategy helps us from that point of view. Uh, but what Abby's doing works for us is, is because of the, the same way of thinking and, and looking f for that consumer that wants that type of product. Abby buys from farmers like Mark, then processes, packages and ships the products to customers all over the UK. It's a farming model that does rely on some people being prepared to pay a little bit more for their food. How resilient is that, especially when you get cost of living crises? Again, it comes back to that question of value. You know, there are, we all have to spend money on lots of things. Our customers have chosen that they want to spend that money on really good quality food, maybe instead of a holiday abroad or something else that they might do instead. So you've got a lot of farmer members and they can be quite varied. How can you be sure they've all got good welfare? They all really believe in what we're doing, farming in harmony with nature, doing the best for the soil, doing the best for those animals. So it's just innate within them to absolutely care for what they're doing. So do you base that on trust or is there kind of any inspection regime? We visit farms regularly and lots of our farms will be subscribed to things, whether it's organic certification, pasture for life or the various other certification schemes. Experts say there will always be a mixture of farm sizes and different approaches to farming. But with pressure for cheap food, it seems likely there will be a greater proportion of large scale farms within that mix. Farmers like Fraser Jones. When the public see how these large farms are, they change their mind completely because actually they think, what, what is wrong with this? There is nothing wrong with it. You know, we're here with a thousand cows now. Um, it's quiet, it's calm, it's just a nice environment. The Lowther Hills around Wanlock Head are a land of treasures, but not all its riches are to be found underground. There's a landscape here designed with one intention, to encourage us to look up to the stars. Along the upper reaches of the River Nith, here in the southern uplands is Croik Multiverse, an extraordinary project created by the late and legendary land artist Charles Jenks. Brian Johnson is the operations manager here. How did the designer come up with these ideas? Charles was really into cosmology, which like is the, the study and the evolution of the universe. Wow, um, that hurts my head. I know, I know. <laughs> he took a lot of his inspiration from the design of the universe and the different designs of galaxies that we have, ranging from the spiral galaxies to the cigar-shaped galaxies as well. The site was first opened to the public eight years ago. And this inspiring landscape also has its own history. This place is incredible. It used to be an open cast coal mine, and then that closed down in the 80s, and it was just left abandoned for many years. So when they ran out of coal, they then decided to build this? Yeah, so the Jukabal 